Welcome to section 3.11. So we've discussed gene expression a little bit in class, so we're going to go over this a bit more in depth, but this will still be kind of an overview. And the next two sections as we wrap up unit 3 will cover specifically how prokaryotes do it and how that differs from eukaryotes. So starting off, when we kind of discovered this DNA thing and we figured out that it codes for our proteins, which pretty much code for who we are, there was this assumption that genetics, your DNA, pretty much says everything about you. And so this is sometimes referred to as the, the nature idea. And so if I can see, if I can analyze your DNA, that I would know you. So that was the, the beginning part of this. But then as time went on and we got more and better technology, as we got a better understanding of these things, we started to realize that there was something else besides just the sequence of nucleotides in your body, in your DNA, that determines what your cells do and how they work. And so because this seems to be above genetics, it's, it's a layer that's even above our DNA, we call this epi, which means above, genetics. So epigenetics is a fairly recent field, you're talking like 70s, 80s on, where we've realized that your genes can be turned on and off and they can be turned on and off in response to environmental cues. And so it's not just what DNA you possess, it's also how you use it. And so that's why you'll see like the bank of switches here, because it's not just do you have a light, it's is that light on or off. If you have a light but it's off, you still don't have actual light. And so with our genes, it's the same way. Having the genes, having a sequence of DNA, doesn't mean that you're actually going to use it that determination of whether or not to use a gene in a specific cell will be part of epigenetics. And this is very important because all of the cells in our body have the same set of genes. They've got the same possibilities. But the reasons we have a skin cell and a kidney cell and an eye cell and hair follicle cells, the reason we have all these different cells that have the same genes is that they use their genes differently, which allows them to have different jobs. Just like you in a house, might have silverware, you might have power tools, you might have a bed and a desk and all these things, but we don't typically use them all at the same time. When you're in the kitchen, you're going to use the kitchen stuff, which lets you get kitchen jobs done. When you are in the garage or basement or wherever you have power tools, you can use the power tools and you can get handyman type jobs done. You can build stuff. But we tend to just use one chunk of our things at a time and that allows us to do specific jobs that's going to be the purpose and the benefit of epigenetics. Now, beyond just epigenetics, uh, we're going to kind of wrap this up. So right now, who you are as a person really comes down to, as we understand it, two things. You still have this nature idea. So you still have this idea that your DNA does matter. Because if you don't have a gene, you can't use it. You know, you do have to have the gene in the first place. So DNA or nature is a big part in determining who you will be. But then there's also nurture, which is the environmental situation you're in, that also has a big impact. So this nurture part's going to be the epigenetics. This is going to be what controls expression. So essentially what controls what genes are on or off. And so it's going to be a mixture of your DNA, the genes you possess, and how your DNA is on or off, what, what's happened to you in your life that's caused certain genes to be turned on or off that ultimately determines who you are as a person as time goes on. Now lastly, if, if, if we're going to get to this idea of what does it mean to have a gene be expressed or on. So if a gene is going to be on, the general rule is, this is most commonly done, is you do transcription. Because once you do transcription, afterwards you can do translation, and then after you do translation, you get the protein, which means it can do its job. So this is kind of our endpoint. But to get to this endpoint, the big area that we can control this most easily and most effectively is transcription. If we never make the RNA transcript, we can't do translation, we can't make a protein. Now, theoretically, you can also stop this process by destroying the RNA that you made, but that's a lot like buying a car to set it on fire and destroy it. You've just wasted money. In this case, you've wasted energy. So almost all the stuff that we'll talk about with gene expression will be focused on, are we going to allow transcription to occur or not? If a gene is on or expressed, you allow transcription to occur. If a gene is off, you do not allow transcription to occur. That's what most of this is going to come down to. So with controlling transcription, this idea of keeping a gene on or off, 
There's several ways to go about this. The first is DNA structure. You'll see that with DNA, we can kind of leave things loose or we can bind things to the DNA or wrap the DNA around proteins so we can make it much more compacted. When something is more compacted like this, that's going to make it turn off because things like RNA polymerase, the guy that does transcription, can't get access to it. Things are too compacted, it can't reach it to attach. Whereas when things tend to be loose, like we have up the top here, that would typically imply something's on because RNA polymerase could easily come in and attach to this, which allows transcription to occur. You're also going to have a bunch of regulatory genes. So these are things that don't make cellular products that are used outside, like in the cytoplasm. These are things that will make specific proteins that help control whether or not we're going to turn genes on and off. So they're going to create activator proteins. So these ones will be ones that turn transcription on, and they'll make repressor proteins. And these will be proteins that bind and turn uh, transcription off, turn a gene off. And the general way these work is we've got at the beginning of a gene, we talked about we have this promoter, that's a regulatory sequence, all right, that helps control the binding of RNA polymerase. And then we'll also have some of these other regulatory elements that can exist uh, typically somewhere around the promoter. Uh, one way or another, they have to end up around the promoter if they're going to regulate stuff. And so we can also bind stuff to these other guys, which can impact something being able to bind the to the promoter. So activators and repressors can kind of bind to this beginning area. And if it's an activator, when it binds there, it actually makes it easier for RNA polymerase. It's kind of like saying, here you go, buddy, you know, helping them attach. Whereas repressors, they kind of bind, and they normally will just kind of sit there. So they'll bind and they'll block this general promoter region. And so that way, the RNA polymerase can't attach because that repressor protein is just kind of sitting there, making it where they can't get to it. So repressor proteins will shut it off, activator proteins will turn it on, and these regulatory elements just refer to parts of the DNA where these guys bind to. So activators and repressors will bind to these regulatory elements, these sections uh, around the promoter towards the start of a gene. That's where they're going to actually do their job of preventing stuff. All right, that's it for 311. I hope that made sense. If not, make sure you ask me questions tomorrow. See you then.